Okay, everyone. Hello and good evening to, well, good afternoon to those of you who are tuning in from China. And good morning to those of you who are tuning in from back in Europe. And um, a big welcome to today's session on that is part of our capacity building webinar series that is brought to you in collaboration between the EU SME Center and Eurochambos and also Spirit Slovenia. Today is the third session out of a session of five. Um, the topic is ways to enter the Chinese market, and we'll be digging a little bit deeper into introductions to the Chinese market, market entry without local entity, market entry with local entities, and also some IP uh, related topics and case topics as well. Before we get too far into today's session, um, as I said in the beginning, it is a, a collaboration between the EU SME Center and Eurochampus and Spirit of Slovenia. So I'd like to welcome um, Martin Sadel from Spirit Slovenia to deliver a few opening remarks from Spirit Slovenia. Martin, the floor is yours. Uh, he uh, hello to everybody. Thank you, Nikolai. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Martin Sadel and I'm representing Spirit Slovenia. Uh, we are uh, the Slovenian government business development agency. Uh, and yeah, we are very happy to partner uh, with EU SME Center and organizing together this program. Uh, China and Chinese market is for Slovenia definitely one of the priority markets and uh, our country uh, want to put more effort uh, in it. And um, yeah, uh, like let me let me just say a few words uh, about Spirit Slovenia, especially for those of you that are new uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, so the biggest part of the agency work is helping uh, Slovenian companies uh, to increase their competitiveness and their uh, export activities. Uh, so we organize uh, all kinds of uh, activities for Slovenian companies like uh, courses, uh, trade fair, uh, international delegate, delegations, uh, we have some vouchers and all kind of similar free of charge uh, activities. Uh, and Spirit Slovenia is also a Slovenian uh, single point of contact for potential investors. Uh, and uh, for international companies looking uh, for new business opportunities in Slovenia, uh, so for uh, investors, the agency provides all kinds of assistance in this process. Um, and um, we also can help uh, foreign companies to find the suitable Slovenian uh, business partners. Uh, so you are always welcome to contact us for any kind of business opportunities related to Slovenia or if you are a Slovenian companies for all kinds of uh, export activities. And we are happy to help you. Um, basically, this is a short introduction. And Nikolai, I give uh, the word back to you. Thank you, Martin, for, for the introduction to Spirit Slovenia. And also, uh, again, thanks for the collaboration also on doing this uh, webinar series together yeah. here we call the Thank capacity. You building webinar series here where today is the third out of the five sessions as I mentioned in the beginning. Um, I would like to take a few minutes now just to introduce to all of you who are watching now a little bit about what we do in the EU SME Center. Um, in the EU SME Center, we do the following. <laughs> so first, a little introduction. Um, the EU SME Center, well, what is it? It is an EU Commission funded project that uh, started back in 2010 with what we call phase one, with the purpose of helping European small and medium sized enterprises in getting ready to do business in China. Right now, as of March 2022, we are nearing the end of what we call phase three that started back in October 2020 and has now been lasting for around 18 months. As I said, uh, the purpose of the EU SME Center is to prepare um, Chinese, uh, European SMEs, I should say, to do business in China. And we do that by providing a couple of different uh, services. I should also mention that the EU SME Center is an official member of the Enterprise Europe Network. And to date, we have partnered with uh, just over 270 government agencies and business support organizations in both Europe 
and uh, China. Here in our third phase, we have a boots on the ground office in Beijing, capital city of China, but uh, we are also very much present in Europe, of course. Um, the EU SME Center is being implemented by five organizations. It is being led by the China Italy Chamber of Commerce and also implemented by the China Britain Business Council, the Danish Chamber of Commerce in China, which is where I am working with when I'm not doing the EU SME projects. Um, finally, Euro Chambres, and then of course also the European Union Chamber of Commerce. So that's the five implementing partners. Now, what does the EU SME Center do? Well, the EU SME Center and its services can be roughly divided into four different aspects. The first one is called the Knowledge Center. And the Knowledge Center means that the EU SME uh, is striving to compile and publish uh, many reports on different aspects of doing business in China, uh, regulations and, and different sectors. So today we have just around 200 market reports and just Yesterday, we released our newest report on uh, China's supply chain. So that is the Knowledge Center. I should say all of these reports are freely available for free on the EU SME Center website. So we highly encourage you to check them out and also let us know if you have any uh, topics for uh, future reports and uh, that we could write in the future. So that's for the Knowledge Center. Then we also do what we call the Advice Center. And for the advice center, we have uh, roughly two things. The first thing is that we say we have the self-diagnosis tool, which is uh, an online test basically that has been uh, created last year with the purpose of making it quite easy for European small and medium-sized enterprises to self-assess, to take a test, to see how ready they may be to do business in China. Um, by taking the test that you can do online for free, the test will then give you back some feedback on aspects of your business that you may need to look a little bit further into um, and how to do, how to look further into those, the test will also uh, advise you. So that's one part of the advice center, the self-diagnosis tool. But also we would also like to share that we also have what we call the ask the expert function. That is a button uh, of service on our website that is completely free of charge where you click and you can ask a question related to uh, a sector or regulation or whatever, some part of doing business in China. And then the EU SME team of experts will try to get back to your company with your question within um, five working days. So that is also a service that we would like to highlight. Um, you can access it on our website. Now, the third of the four is the training center and the training center is what we are doing here today. We are organizing a series of workshops uh, and, and trainings, some of them online as today, some of them offline, um, some of them in China, some of them in, in Europe, some of them online and offline at the same time. Um, the topics of these workshops vary a lot. and We try to cover the topics that are suggested by the European uh, companies who we are in contact with. So we can really be sure that the topics are up to date and uh, can cr create some value to, um, to the companies who are watching. The fourth of the, uh, the final of the four different aspects is the advocacy platform. The EU SME Center is also providing updates on issues that affect uh, different regulatory landscapes for SMEs in China. So that means that we uh, create participation in workshops, organize workshops, organize meetings with Chinese uh, stakeholders and also organize me meetings with uh, stakeholders back in Europe. So, and then we also facilitate the interchamber SME working group. That is a bit on the four different aspects of the services that the EU SME Center provides, all of them free of charge. So we highly encourage you to continue to follow up with our services after today's uh, session. Here on the slide, we have a couple of our next sessions. As I said, today is session number three of the capacity building webinar series. And the fourth one will be uh, on March 10th, and the final and fifth one will be on March 15th. But on our website, you can see the full list of all of our activities as well. A little technical thing here before we move on is that at the end of today's session, we will also be having a Q&A session. So we highly encourage you already now to think about um, some questions that you would like to address to, the, uh, to the, today's panel of experts. And then we will get back to those questions at the end of today's session. We really prefer you to use the Q&A uh, button that's built into Zoom. And you can find that down here in the, in, in the button. 
If you write it in the chat, it may be a little bit hard for us to keep an eye on it. So please use the Q&A function so we can be sure to answer it. Um, that is the final part of what I want to say about the EU SME Center. But as we also talked a bit about in the beginning, we will also be focusing today on uh, IP issues related to, uh, to um, entering the Chinese market. So to talk more about that, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Jim Stukman, who is uh, with the China IP SME Help Desk to also share some of what they are doing in, in the Chinese SME uh, Help Desk. So Jim, the floor is, is yours. Perfect, thanks a lot, uh, Nikolai. Can you confirm you can uh, see my slides as well? See the slide and, uh, and hear you just Perfect, fine. Yeah. great. Um, so first of all, a big thank you to the EU SME Center and Spirit Slovenia for setting up this training. Um, with the China IP SME Help Desk, we've collaborated for, for many years with the EU SME Center because I think our services are very complementary. Um, the China IP SME Help Desk is an EU initiative uh, that provides free initial services to EU SMEs um, that are aiming to do business in China or planning to do so, or those that are already in China doing business and to provide them free information and advice on intellectual property, trademarks, patents, trade secrets, copyrights, etc. It's very important to mention that although today we'll talk about China and intellectual property, that the help desk, so the IP help desk exists for other regions as well. So we don't only cover China, but also Europe, India, Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America. So if you're an SME doing business in either of those regions, um, we're there to support you. Um, please feel free to reach out, ask any questions that you might have regarding intellectual property. Before I move on to who can make use of our services, the intellectual uh, IP SME help desk um, for China came into being in 2008 when the European Commission really started to realize that intellectual property remains a rather complex topic for SMEs. If you're just a company with one or two employees, you're often asked to be an um, sort of CFO, CEO, uh, human resources. And if you then also have to consider so the legal aspects of your business and intellectual property, it's, it's usually very complex. Um, and that's why the European Commission decided to set up these IP SME help desks to really support small companies, startups, um, and giving them the tools and, and information needed to really make informed and strategic decisions regarding your assets. Because we truly believe that intellectual property is sort of an integral part of, of any business strategy, whether it's doing business with your neighboring country, or doing business in China, IP really needs to be there and an IP strategy is really essential. So who can make use of our services? These are EU and COSME SMEs. COSME is uh, an association program uh, that the EU, uh, European Union has with a number of neighboring countries, uh, many countries uh, located in the Balkans, for example, or North Africa as well who can also make use of our services. So if you're a company, for example, from uh, an SME from, from Turkey or um, Moldova, these services also exist for you. So don't hesitate to reach out. We obviously work together with a lot of EU innovation stakeholders and multipliers simply to cast the widest net possible amongst the SME community. Spirit Slovenia, obviously a great example, and the EU SME Center with their network as well. Again, we provide free of charge first line confidential assistance on the protection, management and enforcement of your intellectual property. And just to summarize our free services, we have an inquiry helpline, which is maybe one of our key services. This is a physical phone number and email address that you can write 24-7 uh, with any questions you might have on intellectual property in China. These can be very basic questions ranging from how much does it cost to register my trademark in China and how long does it take to more complex issues regarding contracts or technology transfer. Um, so don't hesitate to ask questions and you'll receive a reply in three working days. And we're also available to potentially set up a call, a phone call through Zoom, Skype or whatever medium to have a chat with you to really discuss and get into the nitty gritty of your business um, and your IP issues. We organize a lot of training and workshops. Um, with our expert panel. Later today, you'll hear from Jamie Rowlands, one of our key experts on uh, intellectual property. 
obviously during COVID, a lot of webinars. We have a website and a blog. I'll put the link to the website in the chat in a second so that you can check that out. And just like the EU SME Center, we have a huge repository of guides and fact sheets on any industry and any topic related to intellectual property, whether it's artificial intelligence, blockchain, the food and beverage industry, um, the mechan mechanical engineering uh, industry, industry 4.0. There's always a link to intellectual property and our guides are really there to sort of um, help you and support you better understand how IP might apply to your sector, company, um, or product. Last but not least, um, this is, as I mentioned, the key service that we offer. Any questions, please send them to question at china-iprhelpdesk.eu and we'll get back to you within three working days. This is free and fully confidential. Obviously, our uh, mandatory socials, uh, follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn, as well as our website for updates on intellectual property in China, uh, to check out our latest publications um, and to simply stay abreast of what's happening in the field of IP in China. And with that, um, I'll end my presentation. I'll give the floor back to you, um, Nikolai. And thanks uh, very much again for organizing this and wishing all the participants a great training. Thank you, Jim, for, for also sharing the introduction to uh, the China IP SME help desk and the, uh, the sleigh of great services that is also offered free of charge to uh, European SMEs, um, Cosme SMEs uh, on your different platforms and, and websites. So now that we have shared uh, our different projects, now we would like to jump into uh, today's session or the real meat of today's session, I could perhaps say. So the topic, of course, is ways to enter the Chinese market and to share with us more knowledge on that. We would like to invite uh, Mr. Maxim van Kloster, who is the partner and director of a Climbs Beijing office here in Beijing, where I'm also sitting. So Maxim, if you are uh, if you're ready, then uh, please share, uh, share your slides. And then I would like to uh, share the, the floor with you, Maxim. Yes. So thanks for the uh, for the introduction, Nikolai. I'll share my screen, and I hope everyone can see it. And let me know. Yep, we see it just fine. All right. Perfect. So um, uh, thanks for uh, for uh, the invitation of uh, providing today's uh, meat on the table of this uh, presentation. Um, I have a, a presentation that goes into different ways uh, of entering the Chinese market, and um, I'll share the specific agenda in a second. So first, a little bit about myself. Uh, as you, uh, My name is Maxim van het Klooster, and uh, that name obviously means I'm from the Netherlands. I've been in Beijing for, uh, for almost 10 years now, and I'm currently a partner at the uh, Climb Group. Um, and part of my work is, is managing the Beijing office, but also making sure that our clients um, who want to enter the market from a strategic point of view, get the right market entry advice. And my email as well as our website is, uh, is listed here. And um, I've always, for the past nine years, and uh, not just over nine years, I've lived in, uh, in Beijing, although I travel extensively within the Chinese market, because uh, as you know, it's quite difficult to, uh, to uh, cross the borders right now, you need to go into quarantine. I'll share a little bit about that later, um, but um, that's uh, that's one of the later points of the presentation. So, uh, Acclimb, we are a regional expert provider of a variety of services supporting uh, SMEs uh, that want to enter the, the Asia market. We have over 700 people in Asia, but we have 200 people in China. Uh, in four different offices, namely in Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Shanghai, and Beijing. So I'm currently located in the Beijing office. Um, because every market entry in Asia or any jurisdiction is basically different, we provide slightly adjusted services across, uh, across our different offices. And we have 20 offices in Asia, and we have three business development offices, one in Australia, one in San Francisco, and one in uh, Amsterdam. Um, in China, we are... are Customer journey is basically first uh, we we help our clients to uh, sort of build a feasibility study or a macroeconomic market research. So we have an in-house consulting department that helps with entering the Chinese market from a knowledge but also a uh, a strategic point of view. We have a, a team that does corporate formation, so actually set 
setting up the, the office, uh, setting up the company locally in China. And then we have, uh, and this is our biggest team, we have an accounting team in place and that makes sure that all of our clients are compliant in China. Because we see a lot of our clients that are actually uh, SMEs uh, in Europe or, or North America or Australia, but in China they have smaller offices. So even though they might have 50 or 25 or 100 people in uh, in the West, in China they only have a few people um, because it's a sales office, it's a trading office, or uh, there is not a, no manufacturing, for example, um, and therefore they don't want to have a full-time accountant. So this is actually the core of our services, right? We make sure that our clients are compliant without having to have a local in-house accounting team that deals with all of the Chinese PRC GAP uh, regulatory frameworks. So that's basically our focus, uh, making sure that Western companies enter the Chinese market in a good and compliant way and stay that way across their tenure in China. Um, then, the agenda for today is I'll give a slight introduction to the Chinese market. Now that is a fairly broad topic. So I've highlighted four different things and I'll, I'll shed a little bit of light on that. Then I'll talk about market entry without a local, uh, without a local entity. So without you having actual uh, uh, entities in China, this is basically a twofold solution or you do a direct export of your product or service perhaps uh, to China without uh, without an intermediary person or company. The other option is, of course, you find a local distributor or partner that can help with, for example, building a showroom or doing the after sale services or also doing the reselling of your products or service locally. So then it formalizes a little bit more. And then afterwards, I'll share a little bit more about market entry with the local entity. So with your own company locally in China, falling under the Chinese rules and regulations, and this can be twofold. This is either a, a full entity where you own 100% of the shares, or it can be a joint venture structure in which you have a percentage of the shares with other partners. Now, those partners can be Chinese. They can be foreign entities as well with local investments. But um, this also means more uh, management because there's multiple entities that you need to deal with. And in this section, section three, I will also talk a little bit more about hiring people locally in China, as well as the, the sort of social insurances, taxes and visa applications shortly, um, because they are very important to take, uh, to take note of when you open a company locally in China, because you fall under the Chinese rules, uh, under the Chinese uh, legal framework. So therefore you do need to be compliant, elsewise um, you have a yeah, compliance risk. Then, and part four is covered by Jamie later in the presentation, and I will wrap up the presentation with considerations and conclusions. And afterwards, there is, as mentioned before, a Q&A session. So here is the agenda in, uh, in uh, the EU SME visual, uh, visual identity. Um, first of all, short introduction to the, to the Chinese market. We saw that last year's uh, economy expanded 8.1%. Now, this is obviously a, a high percentage. It was much higher than anticipated with only 6% being projected by the Chinese government, but that was because Q1 2021 really had a big growth. This, the fourth quarter of 2021 had less than 5% growth. So this is a little bit worrisome um, where the growth is slowing down uh, a little bit. And you can see that with the, the two sessions, which is the most important annual sessions from the Chinese, uh, Chinese government uh, point of view. They gather every year for a week or two weeks in Beijing to discuss the, the economy, the, polit the policies, but also the, the sort of um, yeah, new steps that the government will be taking. They have a 5.5% growth rate in 2022, which is the lowest rate in the past 30 years. Now, of course, in 2020, they had no growth rate whatsoever because of the, the pandemic and its impact. But in 2022, there is a much lower gro expected growth rate than before. Still, the Chinese economy is obviously a huge economy with over 17.7 trillion US dollar. Um, and that was an increase of around 13 trillion RMB compared to 2020, which is still to be honest, a giant expansion in absolute numbers. Relative terms, obviously, it is 
less than, um, than maybe they wanted. But if we just look at the sheer number that is added to the GDP, 13 trillion RMB, that is a mind boggling uh, number. So there, there needs to be a clear focus. And the Chinese government has given a clear focus on how to tackle this reduced ro growth, but still maintaining the quality. Two things in this slide that I want to highlight and that are actually very important for the for for entering the Chinese market. First of all, is the common prosperity. This is something that is increasingly uh, increasingly mentioned uh, since the, the second half of 2021, and this enhances social mobility and allows all citizens to participate in economic development. That means that um, uh, that is from an individual as well as a corporate perspective. So common prosperity means also that. There are rumors that taxation for high earning individuals will be higher in the future to, uh, to make sure that actually uh, all of the social, social welfare and social insurances can be still paid for, but also allowing all citizens to participate in economic development means that also there are a lot of programs and incentives for young people to join jobs because the youth, uh, China always has had a relatively low unemployment percentage. But in the recent years, we can see slowly and steadily that uh, that number of unemployed young people creeping up. So that's something that needs to be dealt with. And common prosperity means that there is more equal prosperity across the board in China for not just the, the corporate uh, rich people, so to say, but also the more poor people. And, um, and that means sort of social stability. Doing this in a very dynamic market is not easy, right? So the Chinese government actually does give out a lot of incentives to uh, the bigger corporates uh, to, to make sure that they become competitive, but also add value to the Chinese economy. Because, and this is a term going on for quite a few years already, and a trend that has been slowly and steadily growing, China would want to shift its competitive advantage from having low cost benefit to a technology driven edge. And especially this edge is, important um, because it means that they would like to be less dependent on importing foreign technology, such as uh, the very small semiconductors where China, China produces a lot of semiconductors, right? But the very small uh, under say eight nanometers, they're, they're still dependent on uh, other, other countries such as Korea, Japan, um, and the US. So therefore, spending a lot of uh, a lot of cost into r d uh, china has historically always spent a lot uh, on r d to make sure that they have technology driven edge this will only continue second part is the energy transition where not only the electric vehicles and um, high performing uh, computing are are the mega teams for the the next 10 five to ten years it also means that growth from private point of view as well as a, as a government point of view they're really investing in these three different uh, mega teams so energy transition is directly related obviously with uh, with uh, carbon emissions and china has said okay we want to be having a zero carbon uh, zero carbon emissions by 2060 which takes uh, a while and in there, they have developed a long-term plan, which means that they expect the carbon emissions to rise in the next eight years until 2030, and then slowly and steadily going down. The energy transition right now, also looking at a global, uh, global level, energy is becoming more expensive and more troublesome, especially in 2021. So they also would like to be less dependent on this. For EVs and smart vehicles, China has invested so much in the past uh, in the past five to ten years, and I also, from my personal perspective, when I moved to China, ninety percent of cars on the roads they were they were foreign brands, maybe produced in China, right, but still foreign brands. And if I look now in the uh, when I, I I go to work, and I'm from Netherlands, I, I cycle to work, um, I'd say uh, more than sixty percent is actually local not only locally produced cars, but also local Chinese brands. And this is something which is very, very um, impressive. The, the development that this industry has seen in the past five to, to 10 years. High performance computing, uh, also something that China is very heavily, uh, heavily investing in. So therefore, to enter the market, um, I say a lot of our clients, uh, they want to enter the market from a B2B perspective, right? So they're not 
uh, B2C uh, companies, they're B2B, and therefore they do have to understand the China's long-term policy agenda to make sure that you do invest in the right way and also make sure that when you invest into the Chinese market, you stay close to your core business, which is uh, something that could be tricky. I'll shed a little bit more light about this in the, in the next slide. Then another very important aspect is obviously manufacturing. Manufacturing locally or uh, manufacturing locally and exporting the, the products has been a real contributor to the Chinese economy. It's getting a little bit less, of course, uh, because the, um, there is less, uh, less contribution, just like with agriculture, for example, which is a, it's a natural trend. But still, they have contributed over 27.4% to the economic growth and has a market uh, value add of 3.3 million RMB compared to the year before. So in there, really important to look at manufacturing and how, as a Western SME, you can integrate in the supply chain of manufacturing in China. Because maybe you don't want to manufacture yourself in China, but you produce components that can be exported to China that can be used in EVs or, uh, or any, any, other, um, any other industries. I'm talking about, obviously, logistics. I'm talking about basically anything. There is a lot of interest still of certain components and getting the right market entry to get those components into China, but also making sure that the after sales is covered is a very important aspect of entering the Chinese market. Then looking at manufacturing outlook in 2022, we can see that there is indeed a focus on carbon emission reductions and carbon neutrality. But as I said, for the, for the next eight years, it will be very difficult to, uh, to achieve this. Uh, and that means that there is uh, still, um, there's a lot of incentives, but China does expect that this doesn't happen anytime soon. Still, there is a lot of favorable policies promoting uh, traditional, uh, energy sources that will develop into new energy sources. Um, and this is something that's been going on for quite a while, right? The first real trend was actually uh, in 2005 to 2010, where, um, and we have the Danish Chamber of Commerce, who really contributed to the growth of wind uh, turbines and wind parks in, uh, in China, um, and then the production localized. This is a trend we often see is the first few years, there's a lot of import and foreign players, but then the, the local Chinese companies, they try to do more themselves. They're developing local players. So if you look at, okay, wind turbines in 2005, 2010, there are very little Chinese, Chinese uh, players, but right now almost everything is, uh, is localized and is local Chinese players. And then uh, of course the value of the industry goes up. So there's still a lot of, um, a lot of uh, industries um, around wind energy, just taking this as an example, but they're more revolving around optimizing the calculations for the blades, doing the quality control, or um, making sure that certain spare parts are, are replaced accordingly, or adding the lubricants to the oil so that the, uh, the wind turbines run longer. Traditionally, from a consulting point of view, we've done a lot in the wind energy. This is why I take it on as an example right now. Then there are certain key industries, such as semiconductors, high-end machine tools, electric machinery, et cetera, where China really wants to develop locally, and they still do need a lot of foreign support in order to become more independent of the uh, import and export of these types of products. And naturally, as a last point, there is an increased demand for intelligent and network machinery that is growing rapidly as well. The, the, the word AI in China is still also a buzzword and there is a lot of activity going on there. Lastly, from a personal and also consumer point of view, China has uh, had a lot of retail consumption historically. Now, before 2020, a lot of the luxury retail consumption happened overseas, um, but obviously due to the closed borders in the past two years, the luxury brands specifically saw a huge growth in the mainland China market because people didn't travel abroad anymore um, and they are uh, purchasing it locally. Um, so generally, not just the luxury, but uh, across the board consumer goods, they're still growing rapidly. There was a 12.5% raise in 2021. And uh, the final consumption has contributed to over 65.4% to China's 2021 economic growth, which is an amazing number. And there is uh, a rapid rise of domestic brands. This is important. I dedicated also the next slide to this topic because 
um, in order to enter the, the market from a retail consumption point of view. Um, you need to be, oh, the slide is actually not here. You need to be uh, localized, which means that there is uh, a, um, a difference between food and beverage that is still uh, very popular to be imported. But for uh, consumer goods in general, there is a tendency towards localized products right now. So Chinese products are actually much more, um, much more, much more popular than, than before, where foreign products were much more popular in the past two years there's been a steady rise of uh, Chinese domestic brands that are yeah, going on the wave of um, high uh, high growth because there is a localization of those products um, please note there will be there is always going to be a product but entering the the retail consumption market is an increasingly difficult market especially if you want to do it yourself through uh, e-commerce channels I will not go into this uh, right now because I think there's also other sessions about this but e-commerce in China although high high numbers it is a very difficult market to uh, to be in because it's super competitive and therefore you need to be very localized okay those were four slides about uh, the Chinese economy um, I chose those four topics because they're often relevant for Western SMEs wanting to enter the Chinese market and now I will Go on, go back to a helicopter view and sort of go into market entry without uh, the uh, without your own entity. So in in each of these uh, three topics, um, without entity, with entity, and taxation, I'll go sort of into possibilities, but also tips and tricks for entering the market. So if you have any questions, please write them down in the Q and A, and then we can address them later. So first slide is the, the direct buying or selling, which means you don't have a local market, uh, you don't have a local company, but you also don't have a local representative um, or partner that, uh, that can deal with this. So I wrote down four points here and they're actually um, very important. First of all, Please note that it is always possible to sell without a local representative. So you can always do direct export from, from uh, any, any country uh, to, to China. Of course, it needs to be on, uh, on the list. Um, so there is obviously certain lists for customs and they became much more strict uh, during this year uh, where a lot of new categories were, were added. I will not go into those details, but if you're not selling, for example, a dynamite, then it is possible to, uh, to sell this um, locally in China. You do have to register with customs, which is a fairly straightforward procedure, but then you can do it directly. So then you can draft a contract between uh, your, your company in the West and a Chinese company. Please note, you have to be, um, you have to look at the legal terms, right? So when you go into a, an agreement with a Chinese company, you have to make sure that the, the legal terms are indeed uh, localized to China and that they are indeed according to your wishes. That means often negotiation without, uh, without too high upfront payments um, from your side if you're, if you're buying, but if you're selling, ask for an upfront payment or go through a intermediate party that holds the money. It is also possible to pay and receive foreign currencies. So a Chinese company can always pay you in Euro, US dollar or whichever currency, but because China is uh, the renminbi is not a free currency, there does need to be a formal paperwork procedure. This means basically you would need to go to the bank. So imagine you're selling a product, whether this is a software product or uh, for example, a, um, a notebook. To, to the local Chinese market, it is possible for them to pay you. There's two things that need to be dealt with. First of all is you need to file all the paperwork. The Chinese company is responsible for this, right? So they need to clear this with the local, local bank. They need to go to the bank with the contract. So this contract does need to be valid and does need to be signed and does need to be um, yeah, sort of compliant. They need to go to the bank with the contract, the, the business license and the invoice, everything needs to match here. So the contract needs to have the company name that is also the company that, uh, that they're paying to as well as the invoice. They all need to be ma matching. And then you hand in a formal application to sort of purchase Euro in this case. And after you have purchased the Euro, they can send it overseas. Now, because China is um, a country that uh, does um, uh, 
um, not have a frequency, there's also a VET that needs to be paid over this amount. So the moment that your local supplier or local client is buying you, then they're is, is buying your product or service, then they actually do need to pay VAT tax to um, to the authorities before they can convert the money. So therefore, this is often a, a discussion topic, right? Because why would the Chinese company have to pay VAT on your behalf? You're based in Europe or North Africa, but this is a local rule and regulation. And even for certain software uh, products, you also need to pay CIT, so corporate income tax. So that is um, a tricky situation. So make sure when you negotiate the contract, you actually are indeed respect not only the, the, the foreign currencies, but also respecting the local record framework. Because if they don't sign the proper agreement, um, then it could be a difficult situation to clear the money in, uh, in uh, China. Now, um, everything is possible, but there is more paperwork. Right? So for example, if they're buying your shares, also this is possible uh, when there is an entity, but then there needs to be a lot more paperwork. So basically it is a lot of red tape to, to clear it with the local authorities, but it is possible. So therefore, if the client, and this is the tricky situation in here, right? The Chinese, uh, your Chinese client would like to have a contract that is directly accepted by the bank or the foreign exchange authorities, but that contract may be in Chinese or bilingual. So what do you do then? So Usually we have our clients of all get a local lawyer um, because they have the local uh, knowledge of what is the terms of the deal you should sign. And this becomes a red thread throughout this, uh, throughout my presentation is for certain things you need outside guidance or expertise, especially if you're talking about legal contracts that have high value, especially if it's time. So in there, um, I would never sign a Chinese contract um and uh, and it needs to be bilingual and it needs to be very specific about the the terms of the uh, of the agreement second aspect is and this is general also across the board if the deal is too good to be true it, it isn't so therefore make sure that you 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 negotiate uh, about the terms specifically the other aspect is and uh, jamie will shed more light on this later but i also added here it's crucial to complete registration and trademarks uh, whether it's registration for customs or your trademark in china it's very very important you don't need to have a chinese local entity to do this it can be any entity but as jamie will say later uh, it needs to be local and if you do it in in europe it does not valid in china Last point, direct buying and selling, which is also uh, a crucial aspect, is as a foreign entity, without uh, a local uh, local company in China, you cannot hire local staff, right? The Chinese labor law indicates that everyone, whether that is me, for example, because I'm working here, or, um, or my, my Chinese colleagues, they need to be hired locally. So that means that legally you cannot um, pay a, a local Chinese or a foreigner directly to their bank account. Um, and they would need to clear it, right? They would receive in a foreign currency and then they would have to clear it themselves. Often in practice, this is cleared under a consulting agreement, but the risk is for the foreign company. So if you do this, and um, I, I'm not trying to scare anyone, this is just uh, the, the way that the, the Chinese system works. So I thought it was important to mention, but if you hire a local consultant and pay them directly, the moment that this becomes uh, uh, known by the authorities, then the risk is always on the foreign company side. And it can really, it can really impact your, your business entry, right? right? Because maybe you say, okay, for the first six months, I hire a business development expert and I pay him directly. And then maybe I consider setting up a company. Unfortunately, this is not possible because if, um, if it is, it is um, sniffed out by the authorities, then you could maybe be blocked from entering the Chinese market uh, because you didn't respect the local uh, local framework. And therefore, it is important to find the right market entry model. Um, so without having your own entity in China, you cannot hire local staff. Um, so this is an important aspect. Then if you're exporting directly and actually you would like to, to go more into detail or you would like to have a showroom in China or you would have, like to have a local representative, you can go one step deeper into the four methods of market entry. And this is finding a local partner. That means finding a local representation. That can be anything, right? It can be a reseller. It can be uh, a one-person company. So it is possible to pay an individual as long as he or uh, he or she has 
his or her own company in China, you pay through a B2B consulting transaction. Then it's perfectly fine. The reasons for finding a, a local partner can be uh, tapping into the local network and expertise. So often I, I would advise you to find a local partner and, and don't marry the first partner you, you meet unless they're really good. Uh, but first, uh, make sure that you understand them and make sure that you do, basically do two things. One of them is if you go towards a local partner, make sure again, you have a local and legal framework in place that respects uh, your wishes, but also has certain KPIs or OKRs or whichever uh, targets you are, you're, you're, you're doing. The other aspect of that is don't make it in, uh, too big uh, contract. Um, so it has to be legally valid, but for example, don't give them the rights of China as a whole. Give them the rights of, for example, one region. It could be uh, North China. It could be the greater Shanghai region. It could be the Pearl River Delta. Um, but make sure that you don't uh, jump in headfirst into a business relationship that is very difficult to get out. And make sure, that's the second aspect, that the contract stipulates a certain value of the contract that needs to be made. So the sort of KPIs. So let's say you want to have a local, local representative that has a certain, uh, certain KPI for a revenue that they bring in. Make sure that this is, is mentioned in the contract so that after one year, you have the freedom of breaking the relation. Then again, we go back to the to the uh, trademarks. Even though you have a local partner, please always register your trademarks under your own entity, because if you want to switch to partner and they do have your trademark registered under your company, and it's uh, it's very, very hard to, to get rid of that. So, uh, so make sure you keep control of this. Another advantage of finding a local partner is training a local team and providing after sales. So especially for B2B SMEs that produce certain um, products or, or high-tech products, there, there needs to be a local team that can provide the after sales. You don't need to have your own company there, um, but it, it, it is important to make sure that, again, this is stipulated uh, very well into the, into the legal framework. So in there, make sure that everything you would like to have in a business relationship is, is indeed there. And um, lastly is for finding a local partner, um, you need to carefully manage the relationship, both at a legal agreement level, but also at an operational level. After all, you're going into a relationship with a company that right now is very difficult to visit because it's very hard to get a, um, a business visa right now into China. In general, it's difficult now to be into the to come into China because you need to have a very good reason, and um, that is either employment or personal reasons. And then you need to go through the quarantine process. That is currently uh, three weeks. Um, so therefore, you have to stay three weeks in a centralized hotel before you can roam free into the into the country. Having said that, also there's very little flights right now between, uh, in this case, Europe and. Uh, and China. So getting a ticket is, um, is uh, not easy as well. Um, there's very little flights. Looking at a local partner. So main tips are don't make the agreement too big, narrow it down from a geographical, but also a timing point of view. Make sure you manage the relationship very carefully. So have either also a local, uh, a local person you trust uh, being employed under the, under the local partner or, um, or take this really as a first step into registering your own company in China. This is again from a B2B point of view. So if we look at um, a B2C point of view, where we say go into e-commerce, this is becoming a very different, different story. So managing an e-commerce relationship where your local partner does the inventory, for example, of your e-commerce products that you're selling, selling locally, this is um, tough because the, as I said before, the e-commerce market in China is very competitive and therefore there will be a lot of highly detailed terms in the negotiation process, such as um, they're not paying you for your products until they're, um, uh, and, and these are realistic items, right? I'm not trying to, uh, to, to over-exaggerate or, or uh, charge forward, um, but it's not uncommon that you would have to pay for the local marketing costs you have to pay for the inventory costs and um, the Chinese partner only has to pay you when they sell the product. Um, these are not uncommon things in the current negotiation when you do an e-commerce market entry. So make sure that you really understand the Chinese market. Uh, a 
across the board, e-commerce is, is rather difficult and finding a local trusted partner for long term is super important. So make sure that you do this, uh, do this uh, properly. Okay, so you have a local partner and you want to take the next step. So the next step can be either registering your own company and keeping to collaborate with the partner or um, making sure that um, you have a joint venture with the local partner. So the next slides are, are in there. I'm not saying that these are sequential steps, right? You can always do the uh, things first, but uh, during the past two years specifically, because traveling is more difficult, a lot of our clients actually um, have registered own entities because it's more difficult to travel to China and they want to still have local, local partners in place. So actually quite a few clients. First of all, I was surprised how many companies are still registering China from, from a business point of view. It's actually quite a lot because they want to have a local, local uh, office that can help them. But an interesting development that we see at a client is also that, for example, um, uh, an agricultural client, they have uh, a variety of local partners that import the products that actually sell um, the product on our client's behalf. Our client has registered an entity in China, purely from a development point of view, from a sales point of view. So they have hired five local sales uh, employees to make sure that their product is promoted across the board. But when a sale is done, actually the local partners still do the sale, still do the import and still do the get a get a, a slice to manage the relation carefully and making sure that the, the market growth stays in place. So instead of cutting out the local partners, they decided to take a part of the commission because they do have to have more work, of course, but still keep collaborating with the local partners. And this has been a very successful strategy for them, actually. So going into the market entry with your own entity, setting up a local entity is uh, is um, quite a, a daunting task in China. Um, there's four aspects that are very important before you register the company. And they are, first of all, you need to make sure that you have, uh, you provide the right documentation for entering the, um, uh, the, the market. So you need to uh, register with the local authorities. Now, as opposed to a lot of countries in Europe where a company can be really set up very quickly, in China, realistically, you have to think about three to six months before you have a operational entity in China. So having the business license is quite quick, but having the actual operations and being able to pay or, um, or sell certain products takes much longer. And, and um, this is important to mention because uh, what you actually, and I, I understand the dilemma, right, from a, from a business point of view, but Imagine you're waiting for a big contract uh, in China that is helping to uh, or assisting to supply certain parts for a waste treatment plant. And you need a local, a local entity in China if you would like to do the quality control, but also overseeing the local operations. So naturally, you would like to wait until you have the order in your, in your pocket. But if you wait too long and then you have the order, generally the the, the, the Chinese counterpart expects you to start tomorrow. And if you then say, all right, I need to register the company first, come back to me in half a year. Generally, this is not a, a very happy conversation with the, the business partner that just signed with you. So carefully timing your market entry is a, a crucial aspect to entering the market successfully because you usually cannot wait until you have your order in hand but you also don't want to be too early because then you have additional cost or maybe the assignment never goes through. So this is a very careful um, careful uh, process that you need to go through. And also our corporate formation team, they, they help our clients with this. There's uh, setting up for the local entity is, and this, what I have here in the current slide is uh, across the board the same, whether you have a joint venture, whether you have a sales office, or whether you just have a company that does consulting work you need to provide legal proof of the investor and the shareholder structure. This means that uh, you need to have your documents, um, very simply put, your articles of association, your business license, your uh, ultimate beneficiary owner structure. Um, you need to have that uh, legalized by the Chinese embassy in your country. Uh, and the Chinese embassy 
the M14 doesn't chop any documents. They only chop documents that have been notarized and often uh, vetted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So which means if you want to set up an entity in China from a corporate point of view, right? You can also set up a company as an individual, then it becomes a slightly different process. I'm talking here about a corporate point of view. You need to first go to a notary with all of your documents. Then you need to go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then you need to go to the Chinese embassy. So generally, this takes a few weeks. So if you want to start the registration, you would have to wait until all of those things are actually provided and checked. Then you send everything to China. By that time, you need to choose your location. And this is important for two reasons. First of all, is the location you choose is also where you will pay your taxes. And this is at district level. So it's not just looking at the city level, it is also looking at the district level in that respective city. If you change districts within a city, it is possible, but then one district will have to let you have to let you go um, and not receive your taxes anymore. And generally, they're not very keen on doing that. The other aspect is if you register, um, if you move your company from Beijing to Shanghai, this is as, as different from going from Slovenia to uh, Italy. So often we would unfortunately recommend our clients, if you move from Beijing to Shanghai, just cancel one company and open another one. From a, from a paperwork as well as timing point of view, this is far easier. Also, you need to choose your business scope which means that uh, the business you can conduct in China is according to the scope you have on your business license. Now, it's always possible to extend or narrow down the scope, um, but there are certain things that can and cannot be done. For example, anything in media or education, you can only do this if you are in a joint venture structure with a local Chinese partner that has more than 51% of the shares, which is... Uh, you know, you have a minority joint venture in this case. So if you want to do something within a certain restricted industry, you need to make sure that uh, you're actually legally compliant to do so. Because if you give, uh, if you give, for example, uh, if you teach uh, English and you just open a consulting company, and then um, you could say this is English consulting, right? But ultimately, it's still education, and therefore it is still a compliance risk if they discover that you were in fact doing education as opposed to consulting, you're liable to up to one year revenue in terms of fines and they're very strict. Um, so therefore make sure that whatever you choose in your business scope is what you do in practice. And if you can't do it, then you really have to uh, think whether you should be in the market or not or find a local partner. The other one is to register the capital and the total investment into the company. So at the beginning with filing the application, you need to make sure that you indicate your registered capital. Now that is uh, money you can uh, send from the shareholder into the, um, into the uh, uh, entity in China. It could be assets as well, but generally we advise our clients to just add the registered capital. From, your, uh, from um, an exploratory point of view, it doesn't need to be paid up in one time. Um, it needs to be paid across 30 years, and that is a very long time. But you can't just put 40 million there because sometimes you do need to pay taxes if you close the company and you didn't put in your full registered capital. So what we generally indicate is put in the registered capital that you expect until your break even point. And then um, after that, you, uh, you, can, uh, you can move forward and build your own revenue. This is important. Um, I'll get back to this in, a, in, a, in, in two or three slides from now, why it is important to choose a carefully uh, registered capital. Now, all of these things, the location, the business scope, and the registered capital can always be altered, just like any corporate structure, but they just take time and paperwork. So please note that, you know, choose the right, uh, the right things in advance. And this is why we often recommend the feasibility study, whether we do this uh, at a client or, or uh, anyone else, including uh, services at the USME, you want to make sure you understand what you're getting into. And therefore, a small feasibility study is always recommended um, before you move into the Chinese market. Next to this, you need to choose certain corporate governance positions. Um, which is basically the overarching uh, framework of the company. I will not go into too much details, but um, just for your information, none of these people actually need to be employed in the entity nor need to be residing in China, except for the financial administrator that needs to be um, a local. Um, but all of the other people can be, um, 
outside of China and do not need to be employed by the entity. Um, there are formal positions. So often we see that the executive leadership of our clients abroad, they fill up the positions of executive director, legal representative. The most important here is the legal representative that is the responsible person of the, um, of the entity. This responsibility is sort of uh, is sort of given through corporate jobs. So every company gets five jobs when they uh, are incorporated. So with the job, you chop the document. So if the legal representative signs the document, it's not enough. There needs to be an additional stamp on top of the contract that formalizes the, um, uh, the, the contract. There is five jobs um, and they're incredibly important. If you lose them, you have a serious problem um, in China. Okay. This is regarding the registered capital, and this is uh, an important aspect. This is the funding of the entity. Why is this important? Because the Chinese renminbi, as I said, is not a, a free currency. You cannot just give money in and out, right? It's not like bank transfers. They need to be through paperwork registered. So funding your entity, and in this case, uh, if you have any money, this is specifically making sure that money from the shareholder is flowing to the entity in China. There is three real ways of doing this. First of all, is registered capital. Now, this is the cheapest option of funding your entity. The downside, of course, is this is not counting as revenue. So it is added to your balance sheet. So it is in the, it is, of course, it becomes an asset, but it also becomes a, um, it becomes part of the, of the shareholders equity, um, but it doesn't show up as revenue. So imagine in your first year, you have uh, 1 million RMB of costs and you decide to allocate the registered capital to these costs, this is from an operational point of view perfectly fine. But if you have certain investor, investors that want to see across the board a profitable entity, then suddenly you have 1 million expenses in your PL and there's no revenue because you've used the registered capital for this. Still, it is the cheapest, uh, the cheapest uh, funding for the entity. So there's no taxes, no CIT, no VAT leveraged over this amount. A foreign loan is also possible, but this needs to be formally registered with the foreign exchange authority. Foreign exchange authorities, you do need to have a loan agreement. And um, with the loan agreement, you have a uh, registration. So when you have the registration, you do need to pay formally interest. If you say, ah, I just file a loan agreement and I actually don't pay back the, the loan. I mean, you could do this, but ultimately, again, it becomes a balance sheet issue. And if you say, okay, I will, I will forego the loan. It doesn't need to be paid back. Then it becomes uh, revenue. And then it flows from the balance sheet into the PL because you will have to pay VAT over this amount. Now, VAT is something I will share in a little bit more light in the, the next few slides, but very simply put, there's two types of entities in China, small taxpayers, medium taxpayers. You flow from a small taxpayer to a medium taxpayer. If you have more than uh, 5 million RMB um, revenue in uh, one year, so that can be from July to uh, July 1st to June 30, it doesn't need to be a calendar year, then you become a, a general taxpayer. The difference between a general taxpayer, and I will not go into too much detail, is basically the FAPIAO system where you can deduct VATs from your VAT payments. But the most important aspect is that your VAT rate goes up. Currently, there is a, um, a policy for small taxpayers that they only pay on consulting. In this case, on consulting uh, revenue, they only pay 1% VAT. If you're a general taxpayer, so if you're surpassed to 5%, uh, the 5 million RMB point, you pay 6% VAT. So if all of your contracts are indeed including VAT, then suddenly your margins decrease with 5% or your clients have to pay 5% revenue, 5% uh, more. So this is a careful negotiation with your clients. Going back to the funding of the entity, registered capital is the cheapest option. The foreign loan is fine, but it does need to pay back. Pay back. And for the revenue, it is also possible to sign an agreement between your the shareholding entity and the local investment. You do need to pay VAT, and if you make a profit, you need to pay corporate income tax over this amount. So this is important. Um, that's why actually it's super important to have the corporate framework very well discussed and in place from a strategic point of view before you make all these decisions, because uh, changing the foreign loan or raising the registered capital or booking in revenue, all this paperwork and additional work from for your local colleagues here. 
setting up a joint venture, it's very straightforward. The only difference is that indeed there is multiple shareholders. Um, one important point there is that as a, um, as a foreign, as a Sino-foreign joint venture, the foreign party can be an individual, but the Chinese party can never be an individual. So if you want to go into a joint venture with a local Chinese individual, that person does have to register his or her own company in China, and that then becomes the joint venture partner. So this is important to note. For the rest, um, uh, it's important to, to indicate that um, from a legal point of view, everything is the same as a Hufi. Because you qualify under the local Chinese rules and regulations, everything is indeed the same. So you would have to do the exact same tax declaration, you pay the same CIT. The difference is you can have um, a more wide business scope if your, your joint venture partner is indeed a, uh, a company that uh, has, for example, an education license. But uh, or has a lot of connections for local sales. So you could go into a joint venture with your local partner or reseller. The downside, of course, is you really have to, it can also be an upside, right? But you really carefully have to manage the relationship between the joint venture partner and yourself because you're together responsible for managing the company and also the strategic decisions. If you have a strategic disagreement, which is significant, it's better to notice before you jump head first into a corporate structure. Um, than doing it afterwards. So it's not only having a good framework before you register the company, it's, uh, it's something that does need to be done throughout um, the operations. And therefore also having eyes and ears into your local company um, is important, right? So you need to make sure that you actually manage the relationship again from a legal, but also an operational and strategic point of view. Um, and uh, it is possible as a last point here, to have two foreign entities that are, for example, both in Europe to have a joint venture in China. You don't need to have a local presence here in order to go into a joint venture. The, the overseas shareholder can be a direct partner. So this is the same with setting up a UFE. Uh, the difference is that you own 100% of the shares. You can conduct direct business activities. You can hire the local staff, uh, same with the joint venture, and you can issue a local FAPIAO. This is also for the joint venture, the case. Uh, a FAPIAO is a sort of local invoice. So when you send an invoice to the Chinese um, uh, party or they send you an invoice, it's actually not enough. They still need to print um, a FAPIAO. Now for overseas payments, it's slightly different, but I will not go into, into the differences, but um, revenue only counts in China when you print the formal FAPIAO. So if you have a deal of, let's say 1 million RMB, then the Chinese um, party that gains the revenue would have to print the FAPIA. And then the next month, the VAT rate that is under this can be 1%, can be 6%, can be 13% is automatically deducted. So the FAPIA is indeed registered at the local tax bureau. So you have a special USB token and a special FAPIA machine that prints this on your behalf. If you run out of physical actual FAPIA paper, you do need to go to the tax bureau and purchase more FAPIA. So this is... Uh, is something you need to take uh, to take care of. Um, they're working now on the digitalization of the FAPIA, but uh, this is not yet rolled out across the board. Again, if you have any questions regarding uh, the day-to-day the, the -day and month-to-month -month compliance of the WUFE and what needs to be done, there is, uh, on the one end, you have the actual uh, WUFE um, uh, Q&A session afterwards. But we also have written a very comprehensive white paper that is freely available, and it covers basically every aspect of setting up a company in China uh, from across 20 pages. And you can find it on our website. Then we go into taxation. Uh, taxation from two points of view, uh, personal and, uh, and corporate. Um, there is corporate taxation and value added tax. In here, I mentioned the, uh, the general uh, taxpayers. So value added tax on services is 6%, 1% for small taxpayer. On products, it's 13%. And they're dependent on the provided service or products. CIT, so corporate income tax, is standard 25%, although for the first million RMB of profit right now, you only pay 3%. So that is a lot less. It sort of, it goes into brackets. And if you make a certain profit, and this number resets every year. Um, you can uh, you can um, uh, have a lower CIT rate. 
I have to say there are always incentives. Um, I have this on the on the next slide here. And incentives basically include um, reductions of uh, the taxes or um, if you go back uh, reductions for, for example, rent. This, and this is very important, is always a custom deal and never a given, right? This is not uh, an advantage that you have automatically. Reductions are a deal with the local government. And I have to be realistic. You have to be a significant company or be in a very valuable sector in order to qualify for those uh, reductions. So basically, um, their reductions, their incentives. I honestly don't expect any monetary financial gains from going to a certain industry park. They could be exemptions or reduced rents, for example. And generally those incentives, they include, let's say a two plus three years tax holiday, which means that for the first two years, you don't have to pay any CIT. And then for the three years after that, you have a reduction of 50% of the CIT. Um, or it can be up to five years exemption for rent. Um, but again, this is a custom deal with the local authorities and more often than not, this is in special economic zones or free trade zones where you are um, a valuable contributor to the local uh, local business. So if you really, uh, to be honest, we have to, we have to think about like setting up a big manufacturing plant um, or opening a hospital to be able to qualify for these things. If you want to have a small sales office with 10 individuals or a local assembly line, it's very difficult to, to manage these, um, these things. And then investment sectors include uh, new and high-tech enterprises, software enterprises, integrated circuit enterprises, and animation enterprises. So really pushing towards the high-tech. And animation is not just the... Um, the uh, animation uh, for, for movies, but also going into the semiconductor design, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Taxation. Um, I'm I'm a little bit pressed on time, so I'll keep this not too short. But honestly, the uh, taxation in China can be a nightmare across the board. Basically, two things. First of all, is the individual income tax, um, and with nightmare, I mean declaration. You always have to do it, of course, but it it is a little bit tricky. Um, from an individual and a corporate point of view. Why? First of all, there is a variety of social insurances that are city dependent in which both employers and employees contribute. And there's five social insurances. The two most important ones that I'll mention now are housing fund and pension fund. They can be different. So for example, if you hire a employee in Shanghai because you have an entity there, maybe you pay 7% housing fund. But uh, if you hire them in Beijing, you pay 12% housing fund. And this is contributed by both parties, the employers and the employees. So let's say you pay your employee 10,000 RMB gross salary. Then if you have 7%, you deduct 7%, 700 RMB between the gross and the net salary, and you add 700 RMB from the employer side. The housing fund then goes to a centralized fund that then pays for the mortgage. So if you buy a house in China, which is no small feat because you need to pay more than 35% upfront, then your monthly mortgage is reduced um, with the housing fund allocation that your employees and employers pay from their salary. So this is at an individual level. Um, and this is different across cities. Same with the pension rates. Um, but the biggest one is the CIT, uh, sorry, the individual income tax rates. The individual income tax rate are only relevant for the employee. So the employer doesn't have any additional cost to do this, but it's calculated on annual income which means that if you, uh, let's say you earn uh, 20,000 RMB a month. So your first, your first two months, you only pay 3% uh, IIT on your salary. But then the third month, you are beyond the 36,000 threshold. And then over the 4,000 difference um, and the, uh, the remaining money, you pay 10% IIT. So generally, you can see that the net salary of any individual in China is highest at the beginning of the year and then decreases slowly and steadily over time because it's, it's based on annual rates. Then December 31st, it resets again and your first salary goes back to 3%. So you can often see significant differences, right? Because your first paycheck is, let's say, 3% and your last paycheck can be yeah, between 25 and 45% IIT. That is a large difference in uh, in, in costs and gives our HR team a, a pretty nightmare to calculate this for all 200 staff on a monthly basis. 
for a foreigner, you need to have a working permit. And this is very important. If you're married to a local Chinese, which is the case in Europe, for example, if Chinese is married to a local European citizen, he or she can also work locally because the, the husband or wife has the right to work him or herself. In China, this is not the case. Even if you're married to a local uh, Chinese, you still need a working permit. And a working permit, frankly speaking, is not easy. You need three things. Um, first of all, you can't be a criminal, so you need a non-criminal certificate, but you also need a graduate degree from a university, and you need at least two years of working experience. This can be uh, circumvented if you graduated from a qualified uh, local uh, university in China, but that means you already live in China. So therefore, having, um, which is a pity, right, from a personal point of view, because there is a lot of uh, Sinology um, uh, enthusiasts that want to go to China after their graduation and they can't because they first need to have the two years of working experience. It also means that you know you start your career abroad or you do have to do a graduate degree in China um, before you can start your career. So you do need to have a working permit if you're if you want to be paid locally in uh, in China. All right, that's probably a lot of information. Um, and uh, with that, I conclude this part of the uh, presentation and I will give the floor to Jamie who will now talk about the protection of uh, IP rights in China. Oh. Thank you very much, Maxime. I, I, I hope uh, everyone can hear me now. I, I'm going to um, try and put my slides um, up uh, if my technology skills work that well. Okay, it says I'm sharing. But... Can everyone see? Yes, uh, Jamie, everything looks great. Thank you. Okay, okay brilliant. Um, well, that was uh, that was a really um, fascinating um, introduction by, by Maxime and, and plenty of in information there. Um, but my task is, is slightly different. Um, I, I'm going to cover some hopefully relevant issues around um, the issue of intellectual property uh, registration, I'll touch on enforcement as well, but really um, I'm, I'm going to look at why it's important to think about IP if you're in China or coming to China. Um, I think my overarching message will be think about it before you do anything in China, um, as was foreshadowed um, uh, by Maxime's uh, talk, but also mentioned by Jim um, as well. Um, just a little bit about me, so you know um, who I am um, and, and why I'm going to be talking. I think for about half an hour, I'm slightly conscious of time. Um, so if, if, if someone on the organisation committee wants to cut me off and in 30 minutes, if I haven't finished, I hope I will have done, please, please feel free, because obviously it's really important that um, you all have an opportunity to ask um, any questions you may have. Um, uh, so I'm uh, Jamie Rowlands. I'm a partner in a in a law firm called Gowling WLG. It's an international law firm. I'm actually based um, now uh, in London in the UK, um, but um, I headed up our China office um, between 2015 and the end of 2019, so for nearly five years, um, and I um, I did that. Um, out in Guangzhou in southern China, uh, not far from Hong Kong, but but but, but in the mainland, um, and um, and I still have a lot to do with work in China. I'm talking to our our China team pretty much every day, um, and liaise with clients, um, all of whom are or, or 99 percent of whom are not Chinese. Um, uh, per se, they're Western companies doing business or wanting to do business in China of various different sizes. Um, so we do a lot of work with SMEs as well as um, uh, far larger companies as well, but we have the, the, the experience in both. Um, Gowling WLG now has offices in um, uh, Guangzhou. Uh, we also have offices in Beijing and um, Shanghai. And from an IP perspective, um, we do a full range of services. So we've got very good experience in actually registering IP in China, uh, all the way through to um, uh, enforcing that IP in Chinese courts. 
um, with, uh, I, I suspect, a better success than many on this call might um, anticipate. China as a market for IP is changing. It's not perfect by any means, but it is um, getting a, a, a sort of better jurisdiction um, from an IP um, perspective. And the other thing relevant to what Maxime's just been saying is, is that we, we do a lot of um, IP contract work, um, so the drafting of contracts and I, I was doing an awful lot of nodding um, when Maxime was, was, was sort of focusing on the need for contracts, important to get local advice, um, uh, and particularly um, relevant for the IP piece. So, so that's that's me, and that's um, uh, uh, and that's Gowling WLG. But on 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 that uh, note, what, what am I actually going to cover? Um, uh, three broad topics, um, and and you know, I think it's fair to say that this talk is going to be at a fairly high level. Um, you know, the question of IP is a huge topic, um, difficult to, to really get into sort of granular detail in 30 minutes, but I'm just going to give a, um, a, a fairly high level conversation covering three issues. But firstly, going really back to basics, what, what IP rights are available in China, just to sort of whistle stop through that so we're all on the same page. Different businesses, obviously, different sectors will um, have different drivers for IP, and I'm going to I'm going to touch on that as we go through. The second topic I'm going to um, cover is actually just some some stories. Really, um, uh, you might frame them as war stories. Um, it's not it's not really to alarm you, but it's um, you know some, sometimes it's good to demonstrate the importance of something by understanding what can go wrong if you haven't thought about it um, uh, to begin with. Um, and so it's just some 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 things that have either passed over my desk um, over the year in China or, or just big stories, big IP stories that have happened in China, you know, with sophisticated companies um, and why, you know, the message being if you can get your IP strategy right as early as possible, um, the hope is that you might avoid some of these pitfalls, um, which can be lengthy and expensive coming um, down the road. And then finally, I'm going to finish off so just some um, issues to, to think about um, when talking about IP and China, some, some sort of hints and tips. So um, starting right, right at the beginning, what, what are registered IP rights uh, what, and what are what's available um, in China. I'm afraid this is a somewhat amateur uh, slide. I've cobbled together some um, equipment and materials I have um, at home, um, uh, at one of which are my favourite Marshall headphones um, and some bookends, which happen to combine to form a head, which I thought was um, somewhat handy, actually. But um, this slide represents what I'd call the sort of core registral rights in in China that are available. So on the right hand um, photo, you've got the Marshall trademark. Um, obviously, that's going to be a very important um, uh, thing to register. But also, you have um, uh, available to you design patents um, and also invention and utility patents, all of which are slightly different. Um, you need to register them in slightly different ways um, and they protect different things. And so um, we're just going to have a very quick look um, at what is protectable. Um, first up, trademarks. Um, so as you saw from the slide before, um, Marshall is the indicator of origin. So um, protecting your brand is really, really important. And Maxime mentioned it a number of times. I mean, I think if there's going to be a takeaway um, from this talk, um, it would be really think hard about your brand. Um, if you're coming to China, whether you're going to sell without a presence or, or, or indeed start a business um, in China. Um, what can you protect? Well, you can protect names. Um, it can have uh, numbers in it. You can protect shapes by way of trademarks, um, specific colours. You can even, um, although not with particular ease, you can actually trademark things like sounds. The key issue is that that, that trademark must bring to mind 
the origin of the, the goods um, in question. Um, I put a graph on, the, on, on this slide really just because as with many things in China, it's just the sheer scale um, we are talking about is, is of interest. Um, the blue bars um, show the number of trademark applications in China from 2016 up to 2020. Um, in, in 2020, there are over 9 million applications. Um, now, on the one hand, that shows the importance of the rise of IP in China. Um, but at the same time, um, trying to deal with that many trademark applications is, is a real challenge. And I think um, it does bear out in some um, way, shape or form why in some areas there are challenges with the consistency um, of um, trademark applications in, in China. Um, I mean, just to give some perspective on that, in the United Kingdom, we had about 120,000 trademark applications last year. Um, so the numbers are frankly mind-boggling in China. Um, I've put a whole lot of information up on, on the left-hand side. I'm not, I'm not um, intending to go through the detail of that, um, but I do want to highlight a couple of points. Um, firstly, when you're dealing with trademarks in China, it's really important to get local advice. Um, two reasons for that. Firstly, um, when you think of a trademark, you want to think about um, your, your name as it would be um, uh, marketed in, within Europe. But also, you've got to think about whether there needs to be a Chinese equivalent, whether you need to get that name translated, whether it's a straight translation or it's some phonetic um, transliteration. Um, because obviously, with a China market, not everyone speaks, uh, you know, the vast majority of those in China don't speak um, English. And it may be better to um, uh, translate the mark. And um, you do need to get, um, you need to have a strategy for that and really need to think that through. So that, I think that's an important point. Secondly, um, for trademarks, China is a slightly um, odd system. Um, in Europe, we have what we call the Nice classification system. There are 45 classes. So uh, you will register a trademark in a particular class. So for example, if you are a, uh, an apparel company, class 25 deals with shoes and clothing. So you would register your mark in class 25. It's slightly different in China. Uh, they have a class 25, but they also have um, a subclass system which um, you need to get your head around and make sure that you are registering within the right subclass as well. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the detail of that, but it is just something to flag. Um, why as an SME are you interested in um, or trademarks or when should you be interested um, in it? Well, you know, as, as foreshadowed already, um, trademarks are incredibly, you know, an important, a very important asset. Whether or not you are intending to have a presence in China, but if you are intending to sell goods on the Chinese market, it's really important you think about a trademark as soon as possible. The other thing to think about, and I'm going to mention this later on, is even if you're not selling in China, but you are using, for example, a Chinese manufacturer to manufacture your goods and a, mark, a trademark is then applied in China, be very, very careful if you haven't registered your trademark, um, because there are issues with Chinese customs that can come to bite you. I'm not going to go into that now. I'm going to mention that later. But it's one of the stories that often comes across um, my desk. Um, and therefore, if you have a registered trademark in your name in China, that's going to be incredibly helpful. OK. So returning to um, the registered rights, um, the next rights I'm gonna have a very quick look at are invention and utility patent rights. Um, and, and the arrow there is um, uh, to two potential rights. Um, you know, there, there is on, on the Marshall headphones, and I don't know if they have a patent for this, um, this is purely um, an example, but there is a, a rather neat um, adjustment mechanism for the headphones. Um, 
uh, and it may be possible if, if that was new and inventive um, at the time, um, that an invention or utility model patterns could be obtained for that. Uh, likewise, I've, I've put an arrow into the headphone itself because there is likely to be technologies um, uh, within the, 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 the headphone itself, whether it's communication with Bluetooth um, or, or other uh, clever, clever technologies that may be able to be um, registered in China as, as an invention patent. So again, just looking at some, some key points, firstly about invention patents, um, again, starting on the, uh, with the graph, um, I, I, I'd merely highlight or, or, or just wanted to bring to your attention again, just the sheer scale of China. Um, uh, for 2020, nearly one and a half million um, invention patents were filed. The next biggest jurisdiction being the USA, but it's about a third of the number. So, you know, you are talking about um, a, a scale which is really unprecedented. Um, key points um, around um, invention patents. Um, once you have an invention patent, it lasts for 20 years um, and it protects new and inventive products or processes. So if you're in a sector that has new technologies, for example, and you're doing business in China, you definitely want to be thinking about um, what you could potentially, subject to cost, um, get registered um, within China. Um, another key point to flag with all these rights is that they are all territorial in nature. So if you've got a patent in um, uh, Europe, for example, um, that does not translate to protection in China. Now, there are rules and regulations about how you can file a patent in, in Europe first and then use a mechanism to then file within certain timelines, which I've called priority claims in other jurisdictions. Um, but it is important to remember that patents are territorial in nature. So um, one does need to think about um, what is required within the China market. Um, again, utility models. Um, the big difference between utility models and invention patents is that the utility model um, only, um, only um, protects the shape and structure of a product. Um, it does not protect a process, for example. Um, so in the example of the, the Marshall headphones, um, a, a utility model would be a very good right for the, the mechanism uh, the adjustment mechanism, if that is new and inventive, on the outside of the um, of the headphones itself, um, that's a, that would be a structural invention. Um, utility models and invention um, patterns work quite well together. The reason being is um, utility models are much quicker to file, only nine to 12 months, whereas it can take an invention pattern a number of years to get registered. Um, and the cost is lower. Um, and there are some tricks you can do um, whereby you actually apply for a utility model and an invention pattern for the same structural feature. That should allow you to obtain a utility model within nine to 12 months, and therefore you have some protection on the China market. Meanwhile, the invention patent will take uh, somewhat longer to file, maybe a, a number of years. But once that is filed, you can drop the utility model, um, which has given you some protection in the meantime. But then you're left with an invention patent for the same invention that lasts 20 years rather than 10 years. So there are tricks um, that can be used in China to ensure getting protection quickly but then keeping it for as long as possible. And finally, just back um, to the other registrable right, um, which is very common in China, are um, design patents. And that would be, in this example of Marshall Headphones, potentially the, 
if, if it's a, a novel design, it would be the headphones as a whole, uh, the shape um, of the headphones of, uh, uh, as a whole, not, not the technologies within the headphones, because that would be the um, invention patterns, but the shape of the headphones um, or a part of the headphone. So again, just having a quick look at um, what's on offer with design patterns. It's the entire product or a portion of the product. Being able to protect a portion of a product in China is a new development that's come in very recently. Um, it, 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 the protection extends to the shape, pattern and color of a product. Um, and your term of, of protection is 15 years from filing. And again, that's a new development. It used to be, until very recently, it was 10 years. So there's, there's um, a, a very helpful additional five years for IP rights holders, um, uh, which has just recently been introduced. So those are, um, sorry, one, one other point to mention on, on designs. Um, again, this is, uh, and this is a cost point. Um, you'll see that I've um, put a, a an approximate cost for for design patents is approximately one thousand US dollars per application. It can be it can be less than that, um, uh, but that's a rough a rough estimate. Um, one thing to consider if design patents are um, of relevance or of interest to your particular sector um, is that in China you are allowed to file up to ten similar designs. And that can be done um, in a much cheaper way. So it's not a thousand um, US dollars per design. It's much, much cheaper way to do it. Um, and what it allows you to do is, is to give yourself the broadest possible protection because you will um, effectively file slightly different designs that are similar to each other in case someone in China tries to design around the core design itself. This is an example um, uh, of some webcams. And you'll see that the way that they've been drawn is slightly different, um, uh, increasing the scope of protection. So as we covered with trademarks, when, when, is, it, when is it worth considering patents in China? Well, Again, as with trademarks, patents are territorial in nature. And therefore, um, it is important to think about um, what might need protecting within the China market. Um, and, you know, in an ideal world, um, and I appreciate there are cost considerations that need to be given to this, but if you are purely manufacturing in China, even if you're just doing it for, for export, um, it is important to think about whether, in fact, you should be patenting um, that, that product. Um, mainly because if you don't and someone else does, um, that creates a, a, a fight which is somewhat unnecessary and they might be able to actually stop you from exporting. Um, and the same really goes for if you're selling in China, whether or not you have a physical presence there. Um, because the, um, the act of selling in itself is an act of infringement. Um, and therefore, if, if that you have technologies of relevance and you are active in the China market, it's really important to think about how that may be protected. Okay, so um, other rights to consider. Um, uh, which are non-registrable. So these arise effectively automatically. Uh, one is copyright. Um, the other is using um, the Unfair Competition Act for things like protection of trade secrets, so confidential information. Um, but also you can start um, actions for unfair competition um, as well. That's, for example, if a company um, is misusing uh, your mark, which isn't registered, your trademark, which isn't registered, but trying to piggyback off your reputation or is um, misleading consumers in a particular way. 
these rights are available um, and, and can be useful, but I think it's fair to say as a, a sort of generic point of warning that in China, using registered rights from an enforcement perspective is far easier than relying on unregistered rights. And let me give you an example of that. Um, if you look at copyright infringement, for example, um, although un unregistered, you have to actually prove the act of copying. Um, that can be difficult in China because of disclosure rules. Um, and you have to do a, um, a fair amount of um, upfront work to ensure that you're going to be able to prove out your case, um, which can be um, time consuming and costly in nature. So a, a very rough rule of thumb to think about is if you can register rights to give you protection in China, that is far and away the, the more optimal route to go than um, later trying to rely on, on copyright and trade secret. Uh, and trade secrets and the like. Um, very briefly, um, ownership of IP rights in China. Um, this is just an important slide to remember. This is a contractual issue. So point one, and it goes back to what Maxime was saying about um, IP and contracts. Um, generally speaking, the way that ownership of rights can be agreed in China can be done so by agreement of the parties. So you have to, and you put it in a contract. Um, however, if you don't do that, so if a contract doesn't deal with IP, um, the result is that you go, you fall back to what we call default positions in China. Um, and that is, um, a slightly more concerning position of them because for example if you are a non-chinese company and have commissioned some research and development in china um, and that commissioning party creates some ip if that contractually isn't assigned to you effectively the sme outside of china then it will be owned by the chinese party um so my point in relation to this slide really is the contractual provision in relation to intellectual property is something you need to look really, really closely at. You need to make sure it's buttoned down properly in the contract and you, again, get local advice on it. Okay, so those are, broadly speaking, um, uh, the, the sort of what rights are available. I'm gonna give you um, a couple of stories, examples of where things can go wrong with a view just to explaining why, in fact, it is good to, to get your IP strategy well thought out in advance of, of, of you doing business in China. First one is in relation to trademarks, and it's about um, the dreaded bad faith trademark applications. Now, China is well known for um, uh, bad faith applications where effectively Chinese parties watch the market they look at what's uh, who's doing trade in China. They're looking at you know big international companies as well as um, other interesting companies that may be um, uh, doing business in uh, doing business in China, e-commerce or whatever. And they then check to see if red, uh, trademarks have been registered. And if they haven't, um, they register the trademark first because China is a first to file system. And they try to use that as leverage for when um, uh, a party enters the China market. Um, you found it, you can't register your trademark. Worse, you actually could have an infringement action thrown at you in, in China, resulting in damages and a potential injunction against you. Um, the key point here is really my last bullet point on the slide, which is prevention is better than cure. And this is one of the the best and strongest reasons why uh, companies should be registering um, their core trademarks. Always thinking of cost, I appreciate some companies, SMEs in particular, can't register everything, but core assets should be registered um, as early as possible. Um, I've put on the slide New Balance and Tesla. Um, 
you know, these are just two examples of very big international companies that have got burned because um, they have had bad faith squatters and massive fights in order to get their trademarks back um, with New Balance, a company called New Bailun um, has been in the courts with New Balance for about 15 years because they registered various uh, New Balance um, trademarks very early on in, in the um, in New Balance's foray into China. Um, and as a result, New Balance has had to undertake huge amounts of invalidity actions, opposition actions. There have also been infringement actions, many of which um, were lost by New Balance to begin with. Um, uh, and it was hugely costly for them. And of course, they're a big company that actually have the right, that, that can dip their hands in the pockets. But actually, if they'd got their trademark filing right up front it would have caused far less pain the same with tesla who actually ended up settling out of court in china for some um, i suspect rather large undisclosed sum uh, because a chinese businessman had registered tesla before um, tesla entered the china market um, and ultimately tesla had to buy it back so um, you know, these things do happen. Um, it is a problem in China, but if you can get your strategy up front, um, then that's uh, very helpful. Sticking with trademarks, um, the point of this slide um, was, was a point I made earlier on, and this is about exporting goods, um, and there is a conundrum in China. Um, the short point is, is that if your business is considering manufacturing goods in China for export only, do not think that you shouldn't be registering your trademark. Um, and the reason for that is Chinese customs. Um, it is possible in China to record trademarks at Chinese customs and Chinese customs will then check goods before they leave to make sure that counterfeit goods are not leaving the China market. That's all well and good. And, um, and actually Chinese customers are, are rather efficient at doing this. Um, that's all well and good as long as you have the registered trademark. The problem comes, and where we have seen it in numerous times, is um, uh, when um, a European company is doing business and using an agent um, uh, or a distributor or, or, or you know, or a third party in China to liaise with the manufacturer, or indeed the manufacturer itself, the um, uh, European company does not register the trademark in China, but instead the agent or manufacturer does. That's all well and good until the parties fall out. And when the parties fall out, what happens is that um, uh, effectively the manufacturer or agent can stop your goods leaving China to be distributed in the rest of the world. We've seen this time and time again. Um, the only way really, unless you can negotiate with the uh, third party and pay the money um, to get the goods out of China is to have some form of infringement fight um, in order to get a court to say that export only is non-infringing. Um, that is costly and time consuming, so um, should be avoided where possible. Um, I'm going to skip, I'm conscious of time, so um, my last story uh, before wrapping up um, is, is on the question of patents. Um, and the point here is um, if, if you register your rights correctly, um, you can avoid lengthy battles down the road. Um, this is the famous case of the Jaguar Land Rover car, um, the Avoc, um, and a Chinese pretty much carbon copy called the Landwind, um, which was um, uh, introduced into the China market around 2015. And actually in China, you do see, or you certainly did see a lot of Landwinds, and they do look virtually identical to the Evoque. Um, what JLR, Jaguar Land Rover, did wrong, unfortunately, was, um, well, they did something right to begin with. They actually registered a design patent um, for the car itself. 
Um, unfortunately, um, that design patent was found to be invalid um, because Jaguar Land Rover had prior disclosed themselves. And that meant Jaguar Land Rover didn't have a design patent to take action against um, um, the infringing car. If they had done, I think this case would have been finished far earlier at far less cost and far less trouble for JLR. The result of not having a design registration meant that uh, JLR had to rely on other rights, e.g. Uh, copyright and un unfair competition. They did ultimately win on unfair competition. They didn't win on copyright, but it did take years and years at a, at a huge cost. And my point here is get your registered rights, get your ducks in a row uh, in China, even if you've got no intention of enforcing, because they are going to be the strongest rights you have if, if you are found in that position that you need to enforce. To finish uh, in the next uh, minute or so, um, just some tips to navigate our, our IP in China. So, um, you know, I think the point is fairly clear. Registering IP in China should be part of the overall strategy considerations. It's fundamental um, and early registration is optimal. Now, I've spoken to lots of um, SMEs over the years, and I know there's a real tension between cost and, and um, filing for IP. And that is something that really needs to be considered. And I totally accept um, uh, that SMEs do not have unlimited budget to register everything. But I think what is really important, and again, I, I would say it's a, an important takeaway, is that one needs to think about the business and sector um, that is going to be done in China and consider the core protectable assets What's the most valuable assets that you are going to have to deal with in China and what therefore can be registered as a result of those? That's the target area. That's the sweet spot that needs to be um, uh, registered. And I think it's really important to remember, don't think about enforcement. Uh, I don't think that's that should be the key driver. Enforceability in China is, is bumpy, although it's much better than it used to be. You certainly can uh, enforce your IP rights in China um, if you've if you've registered them properly. But actually, it's more about having registered rights to give you some blue sky around the, the activities you're dealing with in China, and actually, ultimately, to give you some value um, in that IP. If indeed you need to, you, you want to 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 exit at a later date. Um, uh, there are some other hints and tips I've done on the last slide. I'm very conscious of time. I'm now um, going to draw a halt there. I'm happy to, to, to ask to answer any questions when the Q&A session comes up. But otherwise, on that note, um, I'm going to pass back to, to Maxime to finish up. All right, so so uh, thank you. I will I will also sh uh, share my screen after this uh, very insightful session, and it's it's also uh, don't be afraid. I, I keep it relatively uh, relatively short. Um, so uh, after after this, um, and we go now into the conclusions and recommendations, and and keeping it short, I actually have have three. Um, first of all, is um, I will I will. Uh, um, do them the other way around. So I will start with localize, localize, localize. And I don't mean that you should uh, buy a land wind, but I, I rather mean that you should make sure that your your strategy is actually close to China, and that your your marketing, your your information, your sort of business strategy is localized according to the Chinese market. And this is a trend that's been going on for quite a while. But having a proper localized team that understands the local market is incredibly important and it doesn't just start with the ip registration it also starts with where do you set up the entity um do you want to have an entity at all and how do you manage your relationships um you see more and more actually western companies without having uh, an entity in china or even a partner in china they do register their rp but they also create a chinese website they create chinese brochures and they have uh, a chinese speaking help desk for example for 
certain products. So making sure you localize uh, your product accordingly and that takes time and effort, right? Um, and it takes uh, money as well because you do need to in keep invested into the local um, market updates. Second one is, and this is very important as well, stay close to your core business. I've said before, if it's too good to be true, it's probably not true. And the same goes with the enthusiasm of a local partner or colleague that would love to diversify into another industry because he or she or they see potential. This can be very true and valid, but often the diversification of this means that you're strategically less strong in China or you have less control. So making sure that you choose um, a first market expansion that is close to your core business. Um, is incredibly important because that means you have a competitive advantage. You're the expert, you're knowledgeable and make sure that you have this in the right place is, uh, is very, very um, crucial to having success in China because after our nearly two hour session, uh, it is indeed not, uh, it can be incredibly rewarding to be locally in China, but it also takes a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, efforts to, to arrive at that point. And the last point is spend time finding the local market entry strategy. And that means spending time with the right people, but also um, digesting the right information uh, to make sure that you are indeed choosing the right uh, entry. So that could be indeed uh, going through the, 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 the different modules is, um, they, can be, they can be sequential. They don't have to be, but they could be um, first register your IP then do direct export from, uh, from Europe to China. After it's find a local partner that can help with the after sales and then choose to either do it yourself or um, registering a, a joint venture structure with your partner in China to make sure that um, you are there. Um, it, uh, it is uh, a time consuming um, strategy, but again, it can be very rewarding. And as I said before, I'm actually very surprised how many companies are indeed still registering in the past two years to make sure that they can tap into the local market because traveling is much more difficult. So um, that could be um, could be for you. So it could be a tailored market entry strategy. Um, with that, I, uh, I end uh, uh, the presentation. Um, we're now going into the, the Q&A session. And I, I think that um, uh, Nikolai will now take, take over again. Um, again, happy to answer any questions. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much, Maxime and uh, and Jamie for those presentations. Um, I think we actually do also still have uh, Janea with us uh, who would like to to share a, a specific case. Um, Janea is an entrepreneur who has lived many years in China and also a frequent uh, collaborator with us here at the chamber. So I know we are running a little bit short on time, but still we would love to uh, to hear some of the, the experiences and, and cases from uh, Janea. Yeah, Nikolai, uh, I talked in the meantime with uh, Yernea. Uh, if we need to end really soon, then it would be maybe better that uh, Yernea has uh, her time on Thursday. What do you think? Or do we still have 15 minutes or something? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think we uh, 15 minutes may be a bit of a long time. Um, if that is what it would take, um, then I would say we could do it two ways. Um, maybe we can go through a few of the, the questions that we have received so far, and then we will stop it there with, uh, with the questions. And then after that, per perhaps we can, uh, we can see whether or not we can, uh, I think I will, I'll write to Janea in, uh, in the meantime here in the chat. But, I think we can move into the first question that we have uh, received here. And the first question is for, for you, Maxime. Um, so the first question reads, as far as uh, setting up a local entity, what are the proce procedures, uh, timing and cost for a representative office? Um, well, it's, it's, it's a good question. I didn't go into too much detail about the representative office uh, because from a, from a legal point of view, it's a fairly similar structure. There is one crucial difference, however, and that is a representative office is exactly what the name is, right? It is a representative of the overseas entity. It can hire people, it can do marketing activities, 
but it cannot do any invoicing except being funded by the overseas uh, entity. So VAT and CIT works in a different way. So if you send 1 million RMB from your overseas entity to China for a representative office, you pay around 5% tax on this, and then you can use those to do operational expenses. If you really want to have only a marketing base in China, a representative office could be a good option, but remember you can never invoice any, any third party um, entity locally in China. Uh, you're quite restricted from a business code point of view. As a result, we usually do not recommend a representative office because from a structure point of view, they're very similar. So looking at the, um, the operations, uh, setting up the entity is fairly similar to setting up uh, a Wufi or a joint venture. You still need to do all the paperwork. Two major differences is you don't need to have registered capital because obviously you do not have registered capital. And the other um, aspect is that uh, the tax is based on the, the money you send as opposed to the money that is being generated in the local entity. Compliance costs, um, and now we talk more from a, from a uh, corporate service point of view, like if we talk about uh, a climb, for example, doing the corporate formation and uh, the monthly um, accounting work, they're similarly priced because the work is the same from our side. So it's not, it's not cheaper, it is the same price from our point of view, and therefore we usually recommend a, uh, a woofie because it gives you much more strategic freedom. Thank you, Maxime, for, for elaborating on that question. And uh, we, we have received one extra question. Um, I think in, in the interest of time, we can probably not uh, take more of the questions uh, from now, but please uh, either send us a mail to the center here or send uh, a message to the, uh, the experts directly. Um, but the next question that we received uh, prior to, to closing off for the questions is also for you, uh, Maxime which sort of uh, local entity is the easiest to close in case you want to discontinue your business in China? Um, the person asking the questions have heard that closing down a business can be complicated. Yeah, so, so there, um, to be honest, the representative office is the closest, is the easiest to close. But again, it really depends on the, on the business model. I, I wouldn't necessarily jump uh, headfirst into a China venture with, uh, with this in mind. Um, generally, um, I'd say um, closing an office is, is a paper procedure, right? You need to, to sort of unravel everything you've done. So when you incorporate your entity, you first register at the Authority for Market Regulations, the AMR then you do the tax bureau, then you do the bank. Um, and um, in, if you want to close, you do it sort of the same way, uh, but then the other way around. This is already very different from 10 years ago when, um, and I'm over exaggerating a little bit, but then you filed the cancellation documents and you gave them to the AMR. And it is my strong suspicion, obviously it's not factually correct, that they put it in the folder that look at it in three months, and then they put it in the folder look at it in two months, and then half a year later you have a response from the government. Right now everything is digitalized, so which means that within 10 working days they need to give you a response to either accept or decline the documentation you have handed in. And therefore, yeah, sort of, um, it's uh, the dissolution of the entity. It's not a cancellation, it's a dissolution because you, you unravel it. Um, is quite straightforward. There's two hurdles. Uh, one is you need to be clear from a legal and contractual point of view. So you need to make sure that indeed there's no more outstanding payables, your staff's been dealt with, severance has been paid, there's no more uh, outstanding things. And uh, the other aspect is you need to close at the tax bureau. So those are the, the time consuming aspects. From a uh, deregistration point of view, obviously consulting firm is the easiest then uh, a, uh, a trading firm is the second easiest because you need to deal with the uh, import-export license. And then thirdly, manufacturing is, is, is a nightmare, to be honest, especially if you own the, own the land, which is possible for a foreign firm. Um, and um, often we see that the longest time is at the tax bureau for the deregistration of the, uh, of the entity. But it can be fairly quick, right? We have deregistered simple consulting entities within six months um, and then there is very little to do but we've also taken our our sweet time sometimes due to the complication uh, that come along the way and then it could take up to multiple years unfortunately 
the process, so as a summary, sorry, the process is straightforward. Um, it's very clear what to do, but you still need to have response from the government uh, to do so. If you would like to know more about the, the, the dissolution of an entity in China, we also have a, uh, a clear overview of the steps that need to be taken. So you could email me uh, personally, and then I'll share it. Thank you, Maxim, for also elaborating on that question. And um, we are running a few minutes over time, so I think we will have to keep the Q&A session a bit short. The good thing is, though, that we have had uh, a lot of time to hear the presentations, not the least from Maxim, to elaborate a bit on the introduction to the Chinese market, and also a, a, a lot of uh, advice for how to do whether or not you want to set up your business in China from afar, or whether or not you want to set up your business in China from inside China. And then of course, also with Jamie's uh, elaboration and presentation on one of the very important aspects that are unfortunately still very highly, uh, very often not paid enough attention to, which is the, uh, the IP aspect of setting up a business and sharing the different cases. So first of all, uh, big thanks to both Maxim and uh, Jamie. Then one thing I wanna say before we wrap it up is that we will be sharing, uh, all of our activities are free, but what we do hope is that uh, those of you who are watching here today will help us to take a minute or so to take out the um, uh, feedback survey that we will be sharing a day or two after today's event. Tell us what you liked, tell us what we can improve. We always hope that we can improve our services to make them even more helpful for the SMEs in the future. So I think now that we got that out of the way, I also want to be sure to um, give a big thanks to our collaborating partners. Today is organized by the EU SME Center in collaboration with Euro Chambres and uh, Spirit Slovenia. So a big thank you to uh, also Martin and the team at Spirit Slovenia. And of course, also want to uh, extend a thanks for to Jim for also sharing with us uh, more general information and uh, about the great services that the China IP SME uh, help desk can offer European SMEs in China. So to keep it at that, I think um, I will say another big thanks to everyone for joining today. Don't forget that this is the third out of five sessions. So we do have another one on March 10th. And then we do have the final uh, session in this five session uh, stretch on March 15th. So keep an eye out for that. You can sign up on our respective websites and platforms, I'm sure. So we hope to see you next time and wish you uh, a good day and thank you all for joining today.